Okay, platy is flat. Helminth is worm. So these are flatworms. Um, and flatworms, they are the simplest animals that have bilateral symmetry. Do you remember what bilateral symmetry is? Good. One way to split them in half and get mirror images. Okay, so this is the first phylum that we started talking about that actually has bilateral symmetry. Um, they do have three cell layers. Okay, so they've got the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. Okay, just like our jellyfish did. Uh, and then they do have cephalization. Okay, so they have a concentration of sense organs in the head region. So they've got like eye spots, and they've got like um, chemical receptors, and they've got a brain all in the head region. Okay. Um, flatworms can be free living or they can be parasitic. So, and we'll talk about different classes of flatworms, which ones are free living, which ones are parasitic. The ectoderm, that's the outermost layer. Okay. Um, the mesoderm is the middle. And then the purple right here, that's the endoderm. And then in between, that is the gastrovascular cavity. That is where they will digest their food. All right. So let's look at some classes of flatworms, and then we'll go through all of the form and function, how they perform all the essential functions that animals have to perform. The first class is turbolaria. Okay, these are like planarians. So, and you can see the pictures of the planarians up on the board. Um, these are small, so they're typically free living. So they're moving around, finding their own food. Um, they'll either be predators of smaller animals um, or plants or they'll be scavengers, meaning they'll eat dead stuff. All right. Yeah, those are its eyes. Um, well, eye spots. They really only detect light and dark. So they look like full, kind of like they're cross-eyed, right? It's kind of funny. Yeah, it does kind of look like the cartoon one. Um, but those are its eye spots to detect light and dark. And we'll talk more about them, because we're going to use planaria as our model flatworm. Okay, trematodes, trematoda. These are flukes. So these are typically parasitic. Um, and they're going to actually infect humans, some of them. Um, and they can infect humans in the blood and also in other organs inside of your body. They typically have more than one host. So the blood fluke that we're going to talk about today um, actually has an intermediate host of snails. So they spend part of their life in a snail, and then they spend part of their life in humans. Okay, So then they need both hosts in order to finish their life cycle. So they have more than one host. They typically have a reduced digestive and nervous system, because they don't need a really advanced digestive system, because they're parasites, and they get all their nutrients from their host. So they just get to kind of absorb what they need, and they don't have to worry about digesting their food. Um, the example that we're going to look at are blood flukes. Okay, that's the picture that you see on the board. Um, schistosoma. Uh, that is actually, that, uh, it causes lots of problems for people. But it's actually the second most um, like economically bad parasite after malaria. So these are typically found in um, Africa. So, and they're typically found in areas where you've got a lot of um, kind of contaminated water. All right. So what happens is um, you've got larvae okay, of these little worms in the water, um, and the kids or whoever it is, you know, walk through the water or play in the water, um, and these little larvae actually detect when a person's in the water, and they actually burrow through the skin. So they detect the person, they go to the person and attach and actually secrete enzymes and that break down the proteins in your skin, and then they burrow through your skin. Okay? Once they get into your skin, um, they get into your blood, where they eventually circulate and end up in your liver. Okay? So they live in your liver, where they kind of attach and soak up nutrients and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, and then when they're ready to reproduce, they migrate from your liver to your intestines, where they will, when you poop, out comes the fertilized eggs of these lovely worms, okay? And then the, typically that poop gets into the water, which then the eggs get into these little snails, and the snails host these eggs, and then they hatch out of the snail and then get back into a human. So, if they, when they burrow through your skin, yeah, you'll have like itchy, and it may, you may have like little red bumps where they actually like burrowed through. 
So you could probably tell um, where, where they got in. Yeah. So it's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> Gross. So here's your life cycle so you can see. So burrow into your foot or whatever it is. Okay. When they're ready to mate, they go into your intestine. You poop out all of, like the fertilized eggs, make it into the snail, and then snail helps them to grow up so that they can get back into your foot. Ooh, lovely. Um, <clears throat> this is going to cause, it's actually considered to be a, um, like a chronic disease because it can cause problems for a long time. Um, if one of the signs that you have this is like, um, it can also get like into your, your bladder and stuff. And so you get like bloody urine um, and you get like diarrhea and stuff like that. So not pleasant. It is a chronic disease. Um, and actually, uh, the Bill Gates Foundation is actually working on like trying to figure out how to get rid of this parasite because it does cause lots of problems for people. So, okay, the next class of flatworms okay, are cestoda. These are tapeworms. Tapeworms. Um, they're called tapeworms because they are long and flat and skinny like a piece of tape. So they're called tapeworms. They are parasitic. Um, these are like the kinds of worms that your dog can get, right, if they spend too much time or time outside and eat something that they're not supposed to, they can get tapeworm. Um, and the head is called the scolex, okay, so that's what it looks like. Um, and it's got suckers on it where it'll, that it'll use to attach to the intestinal wall of its host. And sometimes those, those suckers will have like hooks on them actually so that they will like hook onto the intestinal wall. Uh, and then behind that they've got the neck, so they've got the head and then the neck. And then see all of these like little segment looking things? Those are called the protoglottids. Um, each of those is actually, actually contains like both male and female reproductive organs. Okay, so they're hermaphroditic and um, they grow in length by producing these protoglottids. And as they reach the end of the tapeworm, they become mature and then eventually drop off and they get excreted out in your poop um, and the life cycle of them continues. And we'll talk about who their host is. But that's um, what a tapeworm looks like. And so each of those like little protoglottids contains like thousands of eggs and sperm. Um, and yeah. So after you poop them out, they, so those eggs, okay, are um, like this, those eggs can get into like grass and stuff like that. And typically um, what happens is like a cow will eat the grass and the eggs of this parasite the tapeworm parasite, and in the cow, okay, the little larvae actually go and they burrow themselves into the muscle of the cow, okay, and then when you eat meat, you eat these little baby larvae of the tapeworms and you get sick, but um, you, you only get it typically if your meat is undercooked or raw, all right, so that's why, you know, they say, like, it's not good to eat undercooked meat because of this kind of stuff. Okay, because you can get tapeworms from it. Um, you, so the most common that humans get is from beef, okay, but you can also get it from pork. So there is a pork tapeworm and there's also a fish tapeworm that you can get from eating raw fish. Okay, so um, all of those you can get. They don't have a digestive or nervous system. So these guys simply attach to the intestinal wall of their host and then they soak up nutrients. So your stomach does all the digesting. Your intestines are where you actually like absorb nutrients. These guys just steal your nutrients, okay? And you're not really going to know that they're there unless you get so many of them that they um, actually start causing you to be malnourished. So this would be the point where you're like you're eating a ton of stuff and you're like losing weight, all right? And you you actually can have like um, vitamin deficiencies and stuff like that from these. Apparently, women back in like the 1950s would actually knowingly eat tapeworm eggs so that they could lose weight. <laughs> so, lovely. Um, disgusting, actually. So, that's a tapeworm. The longest that's ever been found in a human was 37 feet. Okay. Inside somebody. According to what I read on the internet. And 
Well, like you have feet of intestines all coiled up in your in your stomach. Yeah, but 37 feet. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Um, you can be thankful you're not a sperm whale because the tapeworms that they can get actually can be 100 feet long. So, lovely. Hmm. I know they are big, but like. Yeah, but, I mean, that's still a large worm. <laughs> that's disgusting. <laughs> Ugh. So, anyway. All right, so those are the different classes, at least, that we're going to talk about of flatworms. So we're now going to look at planarians as our model flatworm um, and look at how they carry out the different functions okay, of an animal. So how do they feed? How do they move? How do they reproduce? Um, so, in a flatworm, they have a gastrovascular cavity, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, they've got a mouth where food will enter into the gastrovascular cavity, and then digestion happens in that gastrovascular cavity, and any waste products exit back out the mouth, okay? They do have an extensible pharynx, so that they can extend through the mouth to help them suck up the food and stuff that's around them. So their mouth is actually in the middle of their body. Okay, it's not up near the head where you would think it is. It's actually like, think of it like your belly button, right? That's where their their mouth is. Um, and then everywhere that you see, so see on this picture the dark regions, okay, on the on the flatworm, that's the gastrovascular cavity. Okay, so that gastrovascular cavity extends throughout the worm and is very very highly branched. You see that, okay? And the pharynx, okay, it's the opening to the gastrovascular cavity. Okay, the circulatory and respiratory system, they don't have one, okay, because they don't need it, um, because that gastrovascular cavity is so um, branched that they do not need um, a circulatory system, because all of that food and stuff, that all the nutrients that that would, that would normally be carried around by the circulatory system, they don't need because they are so thin and their gastrovascular cavity is so brown, branched and throughout their body that it, those nutrients can get to all of the cells of their body. So they don't need a circulatory system. They also don't need a respiratory system because, um, again, they're so thin. So they don't need a respiratory system to get oxygen to all of the cells of their body because they are paper thin. Little very, very thin worms. Um, so they don't need a respiratory system and they don't need a circulatory system. Oxygen and carbon dioxide can just diffuse in and out. Excretory system, so metabolic waste, things, waste products that come from like the breakdown of food and stuff in the cell, those can just diffuse out of their body because again they're nice and thin. Um, but any sort of like other waste products, they actually have these things called flame cells that they'll use in order to filter like the body fluids. So these little flame cells are called flame cells because they've got a bunch of like cilia, okay, little hair-like extensions off the cells, and those cilia like beat, and so it looks like that little that little cell's on fire. So that's why they're called flame cells. Um, but they've got these little cilia that beat, and then they've got this part portion of the cell that extends out that's got a bunch of holes in it. So as they beat, they move the body fluids. Okay, and then those body fluids pass through that cell with a bunch of holes in it. Um, the big proteins of the worm that they don't want to lose are too big to go through those little holes. Okay, so they stay inside the worm. But all the other waste products that they don't want to keep are small enough that they go right into those little holes where they get filtered out and then stuck into this cavity and then excreted out the body. Okay, um, so that's basically like them peeing. Okay, and they've got two excretory pores up near their head region where they will ex like get rid of those little the waste products. Um, if you take a bunch of flame cells and you put them together, it's called a protonephridia, and it's um, essentially a kidney. Okay, so it's like filtering the body fluids of the worm. All right, so that's how they get rid of waste products. Their nervous system, so they actually have a brain. Okay, you can see that in this picture right here, up near their head region. Um, and they've got two ventral nerve cords that run down either side of their body and then transverse nerves that connect the two together. Um, that's actually, it looks like a ladder. 
right? And the purpose of that nervous system is to coordinate movement and muscle contraction in order to move. Um, and then also part of the nervous system, they have ocelli, which are eye spots, so that can detect light from dark. Um, and then they've also got these two things called oracles. So if you look up here at the head, see how you've got like two little like protrusions off the side of the head? Those are called oracles. And on those oracles, you're going to have like chemical sensitive cells and also touch sensitive cells. So uh, for the worm, all right? So all of that would be part of the nervous system. So they, that's, that's their nervous system. So they can detect chemicals to find food and also detect like predators and stuff like that and to see light and dark, all right? Their muscul musculoskeletal system, um, they've got cilia on the underside of their body, so on the ventral side, that they can beat in order to like move and pull themselves along. They also have muscles that they can use to contract and swim and move around. All right? So that's how they're going to move. Reproduction, how they reproduce. So the free-living forms are hermaphrodites. So the forms of flatworms that move around and find their own food, they are hermaphroditic simultaneous hermaphrodites. Um, so that means that whenever <coughs> they find another worm of their same species, they can reproduce. Okay. Um, they can also do asexual reproduction in the form of fission or regeneration. So if you take like a planarian and you cut it in half, okay, the, each half will grow the other half and become new worms. So it's kind of strange. So this one would grow like the back half and that would grow the front half and they'd be two new worms. You can also cut it in half like lengthwise and they will become new worms. They've also done experiments where they've cut just the head in half and each side of the head is regenerated and so you've had like a two-headed worm. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's strange. So they're very good at um, regeneration and growing back body parts, which is kind of cool. Um, when they do sexual reproduction, they will exchange sperm between the two worms, okay, and then they'll use those, that sperm to fertilize their egg. Um, parasitic worms are only going to reproduce sexually. And each worm is going to produce huge numbers of sperm and eggs so that they can keep their species alive. All right, and then here's a picture. So they're simultaneous hermaphrodites, both male and female. So their ovaries are up here towards their head, and then their testes are going to be back here. And so they'll produce both eggs and sperm. They'll exchange sperm, and so use the sperm from the other worm to fertilize their eggs, and then release those fertilized eggs. All right, does that make sense? Okay, that's where we're going to stop.